It's nice to speak with you, uh, Len. I look forward to hearing your views on the topic of 3D printing and the supply chain. Uh, can you start by providing a brief background of yourself? Absolutely. Well, first, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so my name is Len Panett. I uh, began my career, actually, um, over 20 years ago as an engineering manager in the Royal Navy, um, leading uh, departments working with, um, at the time, state-of-the-art uh, technology. Um, I then moved after about 11 years in that into the area of uh, consultancy, specifically operational strategy consultancy, uh, focused on helping uh, organizations uh, with supply chain innovation. Um, and then over the last 10 years, I've really been working with clients across a diversity of, of technical and engineering sectors, um, helping them to adapt to changing commercial and technological environments. Uh, and this includes not only uh, today's uh, technologies, but those that have got a promise of being disruptive in the future. Uh, and amongst those, of course, is uh, 3D printing. Thank you. So what is 3D printing and how does it impact the practice of supply chain management? Um, well, 3D printing is, it's, uh, it, there's a lot of hype about it at the moment. There's been a lot of media attention uh, in the last couple of years. Um, with uh, a, a lot of um, almost astronomical claims to its capabilities uh, with everything from the absolute way in which things are going to be manufactured from now on right the way through to the creation of Star Trek-like replicators. Um, it is a lot of hype. We're not quite there. The technology itself isn't new. Uh, it was invented uh, nearly 30 years ago now uh, in the early 80s. Uh, and has traditionally been known as additive manufacturing. Uh, essentially, it involves uh, one of a very um, small set of approaches to making things, um, either by building products up layer upon layer of materials, which is known as stereolithography, uh, or employing uh, lasers to burn uh, or cook materials uh, known as sintering, uh, eventually resulting in a, a finished item. Uh, unlike traditional manufacturing, which normally involves cutting or drilling uh, molded items to make the final product, uh, 3D printing grows the product uh, in its medium. Um, and nowadays that medium can be anything from plastics, ceramics to metals, uh, including the likes of titanium. Uh, once a design itself is created, normally using either CAD software or a laser scan of, of an item itself, it's then passed on to the uh, the production unit, the printers, uh, which then create it using uh, the, the various materials. Um, and today, it's it, it is already being used in several industries, from aviation and automotive and construction sectors uh, to the medical, jewelry, and more and more in in retail manufacturing. Um, the emergence of, of different and more refined technologies over the last 10, 15 years or so, uh, building on the, those, those uh, two approaches of stereolithographic and sintering, uh, really is opening up a lot of competition uh, between manufacturers uh, and obviously the, the, the various associated um, sectors. Uh, and what that's doing is driving down the cost of printing, the, the cost of the units, uh, the cost of the materials that are used which is now uh, opening up uh, the possibility of their faster adoption uh, across various industry sectors. Um, and just to, to give you an idea, the uh, industry watchers themselves um, are, are predicting that uh, there's going to be a growth in the, the value of 3D printing companies uh, as a total by about 25 to 30 percent year on year uh, over the next few years. Um, the, what, what we're seeing, uh, as well as the increase in capability in production, is also an increase in demand from the customer base um, for more innovation, for lower cost of manufacturing, and new supply chain models that can mean they can achieve their, uh, their delivery times, that they can achieve their cost reduction targets in a lot uh, faster uh, time space. And 3D printing is really one of those technologies that can help them do that if approached in the right way. Um, the, uh, the printers now, the, the, the cost of those units have come down um, and now industrial printers cost uh, a few hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, whereas some of the retail printers now that we're seeing in the likes of Staples and Maplins uh, are coming down to cost around about $1,000 each. 
uh, and at the same time the software tools that are used to design them uh, they're getting better um, they're not uh, the most user friendly of tools and uh, design anyway requires a little bit of uh, of, of uh, ability um, but their user friendliness is improving meaning that uh, it, it is really opening up the, those possibilities um, we're seeing already some uh, exciting developments. We saw recently General Electric uh, announcing that they're printing uh, fuel injectors now for some of their aircraft, uh, for some of their engines, I should say. Uh, we're seeing similar announcements coming out from the likes of Rolls-Royce uh, and BA Systems as well. Um, we've got, uh, at the very high end of technology, we've seen NASA announcing that they're going to be placing uh, 3D printers in the International Space Station. Um, and we're also seeing them testing components now at some of the operating test, uh, temperatures and pressures, um, which means that uh, concerns that there might be about the metallurgy of products, the, the, uh, the, um, how, um, how strong those products are, um, seems to be uh, being addressed. Um, at, the, at, the, at the dreaming end of the scale, Airbus uh, recently did a presentation talking about um, the possibility of printing an entire aircraft using 3D printed components. Um, and we're seeing those uses now uh, it, it already day to day in, in the medical sphere. Many prosthetics, many joints and knees and, and implants are now using 3D uh, printing, additive manufacturing. Uh, and we're also starting to see soft tissues um, being uh, approached in the same way. And already cartilage and blood vessels are created that way. Uh, and one or two companies are even thinking about 3D printing entire organs, uh, starting with livers and kidneys. So, uh, the, you know, the possibilities are they're not they're, are, are certainly many fold uh, and exciting. Um, what that's uh, doing is it, it is really uh, beginning to mean that companies are having to look at their supply chain models uh, and a lot closely, a lot more closely uh, um, to see if they're. Uh, where they can adopt uh, the technology and where they can really drive this this cost down. Uh, one of the um, obvious areas is uh, looking at their inventory um, to see if there are reductions uh, that can be uh, made in the long tail of spare parts. And we've seen companies uh, like Bowers and Wilkins, a, a manufacturer of loudspeakers, um, have already adopted this. Uh, they're taking some of their um, slower turn uh, inventory components and removing them from inventories from warehouses uh, and turning those into um, 3D printed parts, which then are, are manufactured on demand effectively. Um, the, the biggest change really is uh, that I think that uh, 3D printing offers supply chains uh, and it's already starting is in, in those models themselves, a the relationship between manufacturers uh, and, and suppliers and their customers. Um, so the, the, the streamlining of logistics models is one, um, I, you know, in due course, as more and more products get produced on demand rather than pulled off the shelf, uh, we're going to see the uh, a reduction in inventory levels that companies hold. We're going to see a reduction in their uh, demand for warehousing. Uh, and that's obviously going to impact uh, a lot of uh, third party logistics companies and warehousing organization. Um, we're also going to st start seeing uh, a shift, I think, from uh, vendor managed inventory as we've now got towards a more con cus um, a con a customer managed inventory where uh, rather than um, pulling in uh, ordering parts, uh, or even having parts that the supplier automatically tops up as with VMI, uh, so the idea of CMI is that you have a, a 3D printer uh, in your um, in your site that can then produce the products that you need, the parts that you need, almost on demand. Um, obviously, that brings with it challenges of licensing of uh, uses, but it also has a, a number of advantages, uh, such as reducing, for example, shipping time. Uh, it reduces the cost um, of that transport as well, the cost of the components as well. Um, and in due course, as well as we start talking about trans-border production, uh, it obviously reduces the cost of tariffs as parts are, are carried across international boundaries. Um, the other model that we're already beginning to start seeing um, emerging uh, is that of 3D printing hubs. Um, much as uh, we saw in the 80s when printer uh, costs came down, we started seeing the likes of Quick Call and Pronto Print acting as central printing uh, houses on the high street, 
um, we're already starting to see um, some of those companies installing 3D printers in their sites so that anybody uh, can send a design to them uh, to be manufactured using uh, printers that are held by a, a third party. Uh, and in fact, UPS announced uh, last year that they were installing uh, a number of printers across their sites in the USA to provide just this service. Um, the other, the, I, I guess, that the more retail uh, end of the spectrum as well, of you know, and there's a lot of hope for this still, uh, is that of home 3D printing. Same as we saw uh, laser printers go from being a very industrial um, product to a home uh, printing solution. Uh, the possibility of 3D printing at the home uh, itself is, is something that's uh, exciting. Um, the possibilities are still very much at the craft end uh, of, of uh, retail at the moment. Uh, Mattel does a lot of this um, with their, their toys. Um, and we're seeing some of the, the smaller designs like jewelers um, using uh, similar technology. Um, but in terms of the, the volume, the retail side of things is, is certainly a, a, an exciting possibility. And I think you may you have answered some of this question. My next question, um, how should supply chains be configured as 3D printing, printing gains momentum in the future? Um, well, the, the, these new models, uh, whether they're fully or partially adopted, will have ultimately a, a, a real tangible impact uh, on supply chains. Um, so in terms of how should those supply chains be configured in the future, um, a lot of it is going to be requiring companies to take a very hard look at their inventory uh, to, to, to really segment um, which parts of those inventory, whether it's at the, uh, at the system level or even at the, uh, the, at the lowest uh, component within the, uh, the bomb, uh, which ones of those can be taken off the shelf and transferred uh, electronic into an electronic um, produce on uh, manufacture on demand um, part. Um, the other possibility, the other exciting possibility is, is really looking at um, how companies can get closer to their customers um, in a meaningful way. How can they bring that capability to their customers? And possibly even as we start seeing more and more um, suppliers collaborating with their customers, um, we might even see the idea that a customer actually themselves um, purchases their production capability, their printer, and really their suppliers then um, produce, uh, present their, their designs to be printed um, on, on a case-by-case uh, -case basis as required. Um, so those, I think those models are very exciting. I think we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, I think the technology needs to catch up. Um, but I think that some of those, uh, the, the, the preparations for those models in the future um, certainly can emerge. Um, I think the biggest, uh, the, the, the biggest area that we're going to start seeing is this simplification of the supply chain, uh, the reduction in warehousing, the reduction in inventory levels, the reduction of the footprint that companies need uh, to operate their supply chains, I think is going to be um, one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges that they're going to have in the near future. Who needs to consider rethinking their supply chains in response to the future growth of 3D printing? Um, I think that the, the, the answer very much uh, on, on who's going to have to rethink their uh, their models for the, in the future. It, it, it's the timelines. There's going to be some shorter term um, responses that need reacting to and, and the longer ones. The shortest uh, ones are going to be those 3D, no, sorry, those third party um, providers, uh, the 3PLs who deal with uh, logistics, who deal with warehousing. Um, especially in some of the uh, the more retail industries where the demand for that uh, for, for their services, the demand for space is going to start dropping off. Um, when we start seeing uh, the likes of, of uh, Mattel, the likes of uh, Bowers and Wilkins, the likes of some of the bigger auto manufacturers as well, who are already um, bringing in 3D printing in, into their not just their prototyping um production, but also their main retail, their main commercial production lines, um, those those companies uh, are going to start seeing a, a, a drop in demand. Um, the other areas, I guess, are, are going to be all of the engineering um, supply markets uh, are really going to start seeing a change. So we're, we're no longer going to see uh, very specialist uh, manufacturers 
what we're going to start seeing is a, a shift from manufacturing to design as being the big USP that those companies can provide. So, for example, the, the, the companies that would have provided GE uh, with the uh, intake ducts, for example, for, for the F-16s, uh, rather than providing those ducts, are now going to have to provide the design for those ducts, uh, something that, is, uh, that they might have proven. Um, we're going to start seeing as well a, a, an increase in emergence now in the importance of licensing models for design. Um, and this is something that uh, companies are going to have to face more and more. Um, the, uh, I, I don't think the um, IP protection for designs uh, in a 3D environment is, is, is quite up there yet. Uh, it's certainly something that's going to need, uh, need considering very soon. Well, thank you, Len, for sharing these great views um, uh, on the, the 3Ds printing and the supply chains. Not at all. Thank you very much, Dustin. It's been a, it's been a pleasure.